In this prison, a brutal and all-powerful gang system reigns. It is known as the Numbers, and it is a dark and impenetrable secret. Until now. This is the story of a daring and dangerous mission. To reach into the hearts of hardened criminals, change them, and challenge them to resist the lure of their old violent ways. Polesmore Maximum Security Prison in Cape Town. After months of negotiation, the BBC was granted access to the secret world of the numbers gangs. The prison houses mass murderers, multiple rapists, and armed robbers. The gang system rewards violence. Only those who are willing to commit atrocity, to maim and kill, can rise to the top. Muhammad Benjamin has killed so many people inside the prison, it's made him the highest ranking gangster here, a general. In the camp of 28, a person's life is in my hands. The final decision is mine. There are people who I ought to killed, and they are killed. On my file, written in red, it says, notorious, dangerous. Most prisoners here are awaiting trial. It can take up to four years for a case to come to court. While they're here, the numbers gangs can trap them for life. The prison wardens patrol the passages, but behind the steel doors, the territory belongs to the gangs. <laughs> They have their own elaborate military hierarchies, their own laws, their own codes of conduct and punishment, and until now, an unbreakable code of secrecy. Mohammed lives in cell 191 with 36 other prisoners. The gang he leads, known as the 28, is the oldest and most powerful gang of all. It was founded in 1906 as a revolt by 28 black prisoners. Members of the 28 live alongside two other gangs, the 26 and the 27, crowded together in this single cramped room. In prison, the men of the 26 concentrate on theft. They rob and steal. The men of the 28 have sex with each other at night. And they exert total control over the other groups. A pause move. There's no man in Polsmore with a higher rank than me. I earned every rank by stabbing a warder. I'm prepared to take them all on even though I die. Mohammed's second in command is Erafan Jacobs. He holds the rank of judge in the 28s. His job is to enforce gang law and to punish those who break it. He also has killed his share of inmates. When you join the gang, we develop you so that you're fearless. A lot of men are scared, but once you've attacked someone, you'll do it again and feel brave. And fully brave. You can only come into the camp by spilling blood. The gangs demand constant demonstrations of loyalty. They carve the emblems of their allegiance into their skin. This is their uniform. Some permanently mark their faces with tattoos. It is the complete abandonment of all hope of a life outside. The day I came to prison, I had a grudge against my mother, and I cut these words, I hate you, mum, I don't care, all over my face, because I thought I'd never come out of prison. 
If she came to visit, I chased her away and told her I don't want you to visit me. I even told her I'd kill her the day I came out of prison. We really love each other. I'm prepared to die for the next 28 and he's prepared to die for me. I'm prepared to commit murder for him. <laughs> Mohammed fashions a knife from a prison issue toothbrush and a blade smuggled from the prison hospital. <laughs> With this weapon, I'm going to go for your neck or your eyes. It won't help to go for your head. I'll stab you in your eye, and when you grab your eye, I'll stab you in your neck, and then I stab you to death by cutting your artery. That's one way. This is one object, but two knives. This way, I can attack more men at the same time. <laughs> The prison's wardens are natural targets for the gangs. They're only lightly armed with batons and tear gas. And they're outnumbered 100 to 1 by the men of the numbers gangs. One warden discovers that he's been selected as a target. Someone in the numbers has plans to stab Barry Kutsir as a test of courage. A number's been called on me, which means I'll be stabbed or cut with a blade. My blood has to flow. So it could mean either I die or I bleed. There's no way you can defend yourself. It's terrifying. Nearly half the wardens in maximum security have been stabbed at least once. The road to the numbers gangs begins even before a newcomer arrives in prison, in the back of the police truck that brings them here. Many newcomers, known as birds, are forced to carry drugs or weapons inside their bodies. Once the birds enter the prison, gang leaders scan the reception area for new blood. Some of the birds will be robbed and beaten tonight. Others will be raped. Body language alone will tell you that this thing's a wimp. I'm going to take everything from him. The way you speak, the way you stand, the way you look, the tone of your voice are all things we notice. The prison authorities try to stop recruitment, but the numbers gangs now dominate every maximum security prison in South Africa. And birds must obey gangster rules. A non-gangster is entitled to nothing. We, the six, sevens and eights, we are entitled. It's the culture of the prison. At lockup time, the wardens retreat from the life of the prisoners. This is the moment of initiation into the all-embracing world of the numbers. It has never been filmed before. The new recruits must now pledge their oath to the gang system. For the gangs, the commitment made here is sacred and lifelong. For the birds, showing fear is a death sentence. We don't have scared people in our camp. If you're scared, you could betray us. If we see you're scared, we'll kill you. Being untrustworthy is another fatal error. Mohammed recalls conducting a gruesome murder of one unreliable inmate. I was naked so that the blood wouldn't splatter my clothes. 
I was the first to sever the artery. The harp was removed and eaten. I personally ate first. By the end of the apartheid era, Polesmoor was in a state of anarchy. The numbers gangs took advantage and took control. They ruled through violence, murder, and terror. The situation inside the prison was chaotic. It was very tense, so much so that the personnel were too scared to enter the prison. Over the years, South Africa has changed. Johnny Jansen, the first black man to head maximum security here, wants the prison to change along with it. He realizes he needs to do something as bold as the gangs. So he brings in an expert in conflict resolution. But the expert herself is soon caught off guard on the first visit. I'd never been in a prison before. And as I walked down the corridor, the faces looking back at me, I saw my brother, my uncle, my friend. They looked no different. And I was very sad. I was struck by such a deep sadness. Locked in their cells, the men of the numbers exchange their messages. They agree that Joanna is a threat to the gang system. Thomas N. Galobert, senior member and fighting general of the 26, is the most hostile. I first thought Joanna had come to kill the number. And if you try to kill the number, we must kill you first. This Joanna had to be stabbed in here. I did everything in my power to stab her. But perhaps God was with her without her even knowing. In cell 191, the inmates meet to discuss Joanna and the threat she poses. To one another, they voice their fierce loyalty to the numbers and its code of violence. But privately, some view Joanna as a chance for change. The gangs inside prison will keep me here. Why? because they need me. My wife and children want me outside because they need me there. I can't be in two places at the same time. No, it, no, it tears a man apart. Joanna goes right to the heart of the numbers system and invites its leaders to take part in a series of workshops. They gather in an isolated cell in the prison roof. This is no ordinary cell. It's where Nelson Mandela was held for six years. You, the place um, where he began negotiations with the old apartheid regime. This is an historic occasion. The symbolism is not lost on them. Welcome to the Change Begins With Me series. My role is to facilitate a process where we can share the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience that lies in this room. And so I want to encourage each of you to participate. Joanna's goal is to help the inmates resolve conflict through dialogue, not violence. Their skepticism is universal. Most men here have killed in cold blood. Violence is the only way they know. So we're going to go right into our exercise now. She encourages members of rival gangs to drop their guard and mingle indiscriminately. Okay, groups of five. Stay there. Stay there. Have you all got a partner? Okay, now you, that's your partner for the next exercise. Meanwhile, down in the courtyard, gang members grow uneasy about what the leaders are doing on the roof. The decision is quickly made. Attending Joanna's workshop could get you killed. I'm scared, yes. Because the last law states that the day I talk about this thing, that day I will die. But I've made my decision. 
Maar ik het moest op een gemaakt. Thomas, the fighting general who wants Joanna murdered, doesn't join them. But even he begins to wonder. There's a big war between the number and change. If I tell you that I want to leave the number, then I'll lose my head. Despite the danger, Thomas decides to meet with Joanna. I admire this courage to admit that to me. And it actually inspired me to build a relationship with him. I think the risk was probably greater for him than for me. That kind of music calms me. Even I will equally proud of my feelings. So in a sense, my feelings they are almost by me. It it they are by no. I mean as as much as a powerful thing that I know. I I I guess not a bit too sensitive with my feelings. Okay. En my doel is nie om jou te dwing om jou gevoelens te deel nie. Maar as ons o, it's to help us understand conflict. Wat doen ons met ons gevoelens in die tronk? We press it down. We suppress it. Why do we do that? We don't want other people to see. Why else? We are men scared. We are scared? And we are men. And you are men. Because you got that message from birth. You are a boy and boys don't cry. And men don't cry, and gang members don't cry, and gang leaders don't cry. Thank you. I come, Mr. President. It's only day seven of the workshops, and the gangsters already show signs of transformation. You can stand there and you can take a big leap. What do you mean, run and just jump, just jump? Okay, guys, I'm going to do this now because I want to feel the way I've never felt before. I've never been kissed by people in my whole life. Right? I'm really... <laughs> By the end of the workshops, Joanna must prepare these gangsters for the toughest work yet to come, finishing the transformation on their own. I am not that naive to believe that one series of training workshops is going to change a man who has been a gang member for most of his life and who has committed horrendous crimes, who is in the heart of the gang system. 
but I see a struggle. And while that struggle is there, I will engage with it. Muhammad, you're not with us? You want to tell me what's happening with you? Jaina, I'm feeling like an idiot. Because I will, I'm also a follower. I follow other people, you know. I feel pain not in my heart, but in my gut. And now, I feel pain for all the pain that I've caused. In other people's lives, in my family's lives, and my, my life too. I'm a guy, I'm not scared of anything. But all those years, my actions was idiotic. And I feel like an idiot. Because I was a follower. I never chose the road myself. I just went on with the road, and my road ended here. For 34 years, I spent here. I'm like a boat in the sea, and the sea is getting rougher and rougher and rougher, and I'm going with the stream. I can't help myself to get in the calm waters. And for now, that's all I'm going to say. Arafan's day in court arrives. The thought that he might be released from prison unnerves him. What am I going to do with my life? Do I go back to where I've come from? Or do I hold on to the things I've learned inside prison, like change is possible? When the court tells me that I'm innocent and free to go, it's a big risk for me. I'm scared to go outside. I was out there, and I came back. Arafan has no choice but to face his fear. The judge throws out his case. He's free to go. As Mohammed's court hearing approaches, he wonders how his family would react to his return. He met his wife Rahmat when she was 12 years old. By that time, he was already a hardened ex-convict. The first time I saw Rahmat, I'd already sodomized boys. I'd already raped. I was standing on a corner. She didn't see me. Before she knew it, I had her around the neck. He dragged me to a field and raped me. For 30 years, I had other boyfriends. I had children with other men, but I never felt what I felt for him. Maybe it's because he was my first boyfriend, or, as they say, you fall in love with your rapist. This is the community that Mohammed and Arafan must face when they leave prison. Three quarters of the men are without work. The police cannot enter some neighborhoods without military support. 
Each day, some nine murders and 31 armed robberies are committed. There's one small bedroom in Mohammed's house. It's shared by his mother-in-law, who's bedridden, two of his stepdaughters, and two grandchildren. Mohammed's wife, Rahmat, works as a cleaner in a factory. She earns $40 a month. She is the family breadwinner. If there was somebody else who worked in this house, things might be better. I can't give my children what they want. So it's very tense in the house. Shafika is one of Mohammed's four stepdaughters with two children of her own. She is HIV positive. I'm unhappy in this house. I want to be on my own with my children. I feel like a prisoner. Fuzlin is Mohammed's youngest stepdaughter. She has the most to fear from Mohammed's release. The last time he was home, he attacked her at a railway station. She was just 13. He had a knife and said if I scream, he'll stab me. I saw that this child is unwilling. She's not prepared to do this. So I began to force, 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 force. After 34 years in the prison system, what worries Mohammed the most is readjusting to life outside its walls. When I, as an old criminal, come out, I won't know how to stand at my gate. I'm used to resting against bars with my arms through them. At my house, there aren't any bars, just a gate. I rest my hands on top of the gate, but it feels uncomfortable. I'll miss the bars in front of my eyes. I'll miss them. Three weeks have passed since Arafan's release, and he's constantly surrounded by his old life luring him back. So far, he's been able to resist it. That day, I made a decision. From now on, I'm going forwards, not backwards. I'm going to my mother's house. The woman he once threatened to murder, that once inspired his I hate you mom facial tattoo, agrees to take him back. I've done many bad things and I can't put them right. All I can do is ask for forgiveness. Back at Polesmore, Mohammed's rate charges are dropped. He's coming home to his family. And they're scared. Old friends from his prison and street gangs are there to welcome him back. He feels relaxed and comfortable around them. It contrasts starkly with the strained uneasiness he feels with his family. When I came through the gate, I could feel, I could smell, I could see that these people don't know where they are with me. They don't know if it's the same old Muhammad or a better Muhammad. As the days pass, Muhammad grows more and more distant from his family. Each and every one decides when and how they want to eat. Never is a round table with the whole family. I would really like that to feel the love of a family around a table. But yeah, the love ain't there. 
Shafika would rather go without food than join Mohammed for a meal. Mutual resentment and irritation build, threatening to erupt into violence at any minute. At night when I sleep, I had Mikael cry. And I can't sleep. Why is he crying? And I stand up and knock on the window. Then they... It sounded like he wanted to break the window because my child was crying and I couldn't get him to stop. He came in and threatened to beat me. Mohammed is not yet ready to resolve the conflict through dialogue and further retreats into his own world. There are times when I don't talk to anyone. But I know, yeah. Hey. They think things are going to start again. But nothing's happening. I don't feel like talking. And they're scared. They're afraid. Instead of resorting to violence, Mohammed turns to Joanna, the woman who helped him change his ways to help his family do the same. What is the issue? These people are still scared. This is all Mohammed. Muhammad. Muhammad, they knew. And, uh, it's Africa. She so believes I'm here to oppress her. I, uh, I nearly hit her with a uh, pickaxe, a pick handle in the past. I mean, a puck still alone. But it's going to start me. It's going to do it. And I'm going to go. 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 I'm going to go. And I'm going to go. And I'm yeah. I would like uh, me and them to talk about uh, how does they really feel mm. about all these things that I've done. Me, you know, me myself, I never had a family who loved me. I don't want to make a coin a copy. Mohammed had commanded respect as a gang leader in prison. Unable to get a job, he is now held in contempt by his family. Before she agrees to work with the entire family, Joanna encourages Mohammed to examine his violent nature by tracing it back to its source. Back to the point where his heart hardened. Back to his painful childhood. I saw a lot of brutality. I saw a lot of people hurting other people. And as the years passed by, I became involved in this trauma. Like a circle. Everybody here gets involved. Mohammed's mother died of tuberculosis when he was just nine. Dach. The day she died, I couldn't cry. With her death, everything died. It's been three months since Arafan's release, and Joanna stops by to see how he's been coping. Hello, How are you? Nice to see you again. Can I sit down? I feel great, man. I feel good. I got that. Can I show you? Okay. Arafan has been making real progress. Proudly, he tells her he's been drug-free for more than two months. 60 days. Mm -hmm. This was the last one, the 60 days. The green one. Clean and serene for 60 days. I'm into it now. I'm making it in my life. I'm going to look for it. What and else do you want to achieve? Um, to send the message out. Um, I learned to send the message out. Joanna finds the perfect place where Arafan's message of nonviolence can make a real impact. What I will say is, crime doesn't pay. You will never pay. A clue, you will have a dream. And no matter what it is, I try it. I'm positive to them.
Arafan has struck a chord with the students. The children he's been talking to overwhelm him with their responses. Dear Arafan, I write this letter to tell you how much I like you. I forgive you and pray for you. You are always in my thoughts. Prison is not meant for you. You are as special as everyone is. You can change by asking those you wrong for forgiveness. I never expected to get support from children. It gives me power to carry on with what I'm doing. Back at the Benjamin house, Mohammed works hard to improve himself, but it's an unrelenting battle. Today, a family conflict has upset him, and he's angry. Yeah. My daughter came in here crying, and uh, she said to me, the husband hit her in the road in front of all the uh, taxi drivers. And uh, I said, I had to, I see Bangu Maini, I come back to the house. I said, Ma, I said, Dakaruka, I said, Pa, I said, I said, two year free bastard. No, 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 do it full now, he, and man. I said, I'm going to get a bomb, and I'm going to get a bomb. I like to kill the family. I don't care what the consequences may be. <laughs> This moment could break Mohammed. But he doesn't give in to temptation and works out his aggression in the backyard. His family catches a frightening glimpse of the old Mohammed. But for him, it's a major breakthrough. Arafan is about to take the biggest step on his journey toward redemption. His tattoos, once a lifelong pledge of loyalty to his gang, have now become a prison in themselves. Hearing Arafan's story, this Cape Town doctor offers to remove them for free. Dear Father, grant us the opportunity to see beyond what we are seeing and try to really help the family and me myself. Lord, everything that I'm asking, I'm not asking because I'm deserving, but I'm asking it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mohammed. Let's have a seat there. At Mohammed's insistence, Joanna agrees to run a workshop for his family. She pushes them to talk about life together again and insists on brutal honesty. Yeah. Living at 61 Esaha Street is like... Give me the picture. Feels like a graveyard. Feels like a graveyard. Let it go. When there's nothing, no food, no money, no electricity, then there's no warmth. Then like everybody is dead. It's ice, ice cold. There's no love, there's no understanding, there's nothing. So are we saying here all are guilty? Yes. yes. Very angry when the kids is crying in the house and the adults are there on the spot. But the kids are crying. And that is one thing that makes me very angry. A child must cry. Even during the night. He must cry. I'm tired, I'm sick. I can't do it. I cannot, cannot do it anymore. Then they break for lunch. Astonishingly, it's the first time they have ever, as a family, sat together for a meal. 
Later, Joanna uses the same exercises she used to open the hearts of hardened criminals. What does this teach you about cooperation? 461 is the high street. We can laugh together and we can play together. We can play together. And we can even cry together. So it's about giving and receiving. They break again, and there is another family first. Mohammed asks to hold his grandson. I was partly scared. I never done it before. And it surprised me that I was so small at the time. To get this big now. I don't think there's anything stopping Muhammad from living a meaningful life. He is faced with many challenges though. I just hope uh, to mighty Father in heaven make your heart so soft that you can love me. A killer, an ex a gang leader in person and outside person. I know it's hard for you to love me for the deeds I've done in the past, but uh, pray for me and don't do such things anymore in the future. And uh, I will pray for your love. That's all I want from you is your love. outside for seven months now, far longer than at any time since he was nine years old. What started out as a doubtful experiment has turned into a remarkable journey and also a work in progress. I'm not an angel. I'm not a bit clean yet. I'm struggling. And I believe uh, I can become clean. But it didn't happen overnight. But I made the first step. I said no to crime. I made the first step. I made the choice uh, not to go back to prison again. I'm going to get it right. 